<coughs> Hi folks, this is Jason. I hope you're okay today. It's good to be with you. We're looking at uh, the theology of John Wimber in his understanding of healing. And it's a relevant topic. There are many faith healers around today. And so to take one well-known faith healer who's passed away now, and to take that theology and critique it will help us to be more discerning. Whenever new movements come, we'll be better equipped to assess them from a biblical perspective. Excuse me. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, we give you the praise and the glory today. And Father God, we acknowledge that you are our God today, and we give you the praise and the glory. And Father, as we look at your word today, we pray that you'll be pleased to bless, and that, Lord, we would know your grace and your love and your blessings, Lord, in your name. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> We're going to look at uh, John Wimber's model, and then number two, how do, does Wimber's model compare with other healing models? And then three, we're going to look at the strength and weaknesses of Wimber's model. First of all, Wimber's model. Wimber believes that healing by God on a mass scale is definitely needed today in the church. Wimber gives five reasons for this. Number one, healing demonstrates Christ's compassion and mercy in Matthew 14:14. 14, 14. Number two, healing bears witness to Christ's claims, Matthew 8.14. And number three, healings demonstrate God's kingdom has arrived, Matthew 4.23. Number four, healings demonstrate spirituality, Matthew 9, verse 1 to 8. And number five, healings can bring people to repentance, Luke chapter 10, verse 8 to 12. Wimber gives some criticism of Christians who do not hold his position. He quotes, Evangelical Christians who deny divine healing are biblical in are biblical in one sense. They zealously defend Christ's healing ministry, but for theological reasons they deny modern signs and wonders. In this regard, their beliefs lead them to view signs and wonders more as modern rationalists and materialists than as historic Christians. They teach that faith in Christ based on contemporary miracle or healing experience is no longer needed since we have the New Testament. Their theology is in part motivated by accommodation to materialism and rationalism, though they deny this on theological grounds. End of quote. Wimber then develops in detail his own position. He makes the point that if pain can make us look to Jesus, then why not healing? In healing, can't we also experience God's love and mercy? Wimber then rebuts a theologian who makes the point that healing theology makes immature Christians. Wimber replies with the thought that prayer for healing tests the faith of Christians and this produces maturity. Wimber then deals with the problem of suffering. Why does God allow this? He has four points here. Number one, God does not directly will evil. Number two, God does, does directly remove evil. Number three, God frustrates evil and turns it into good. Number four, some evil which we experience we must not accept passively. I take it here evil means suffering for Wimber. It's important to show some of Wimber's subjective reasons for his view of healing. In his book, he mixes his argument with his own experience. This is, gives his writing an extra powerful punch, although I'm not saying I agree with it. It is powerful writing. It lets the readers know he has been cynical of faith healers. This assures the readers he is not jumping on a popular teaching bandwagon. He, though, he then goes on to describe how he is, was influenced by Professor Donald Mc. Gavran and C. Wagner at the Fuller School of World Mission. These men inspired Wimber to take a positive view of signs and wonders. However, Wimber's view on healing was radically changed through, through his wife. Here he gives the details, quote, Carol then reasoned that if God had filled her with the Holy Spirit while sleeping, he could work the same way in me. In order to test her theory, she devised a careful plan using painful rheumatoid arthritis in one of her shoulders as a test case. One night when we were in a cabin in the mountains, 
She waited until I fell asleep and placed one of my hands on her shoulder. She then said, okay, Lord, now do it. A surge of heat and energy came into her shoulder and the pain disappeared. She was healed. I awakened wondering why my hand was hot. Carol told me what happened. I was puzzled about healing, but glad that her pain was gone still. Even this did not sway me towards practicing divine healing. End of quote. Now we get more of the theology and practice of Wimber's teaching. Wimber looks at the Old Testament and New. In the Old Testament he points out that sickness comes through disobedience. Quote, if a person obeys God then he will be healthy. Proverbs 4, 20, He then notes that in the New Testament there is healing, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. But this healing is not its fullness until we are with God for eternity. Wimber then notes that healing and the atonement go together. The Greek word zozos can overlap with healing and salvation. Healing is also a sign that God is present and a new age has arrived. He uses Luke 7, 22, 23 to back this up. More biblical content is discussed with the life of Jesus. And Wimber says that John 20, 30 teaches that healing glorifies Jesus. Wimber notes that Jesus never saw anything good in sickness. Finally, that Jesus sent his disciples on healing missions. Luke 9, 1 to 9. Again, Wimber descends to personal experience as an argument for this theological position. He talks about his vision of honeycomb. The honeycomb was in the sky dripping honey on the world below. This meant for Wimber that, he, that healing had significance. He goes on to elaborate, quote, He said, it is mercy. It is, he said, it's my mercy, John. For some people it's a blessing, but for others it's a hindrance. There's plenty for everyone. Don't ever beg me for healing again. The problem isn't at my end, John. It's down there. For the reader who has never had a vision of supernatural hearing God in this fashion, I did not physically hear God speak. I experienced more of an impression. An impression. A spiritual sense of God speaking to me. Time proved that what I thought I had heard was true. After mentioning that he had many trials in practicing healing, Wimber asked the question, what does Jesus do? what does Jesus heal? Here he starts by saying we are made to experience God's love and communion with him. Ephesians 2 4 9. But the problem is our sin has broken our communion with God. This means that the whole person has sinned and so the whole person needs redeeming. Conclusions are made from this theology. Number one, firstly that the spirit of a person needs healing. Number two, the healing of past hurts. Number three, the healing of demonized and mental illness. Four, the healing of body and part of salvation. Wimber points out that often it's because of sin in our lives and not repenting that we are still ill. Also, Wimber lays great stress on just on the not just on the physical healing of a person but emotional healing too. Quote Many people cannot face their painful memories and suffer inevitable emotional trauma. They need scanalon says they need scanalon says the power of the Holy Spirit and the gift of faith to, to be able to face the past thus freeing themselves to live fully in the future. Understood in this way, the healing of memories is not the elimination of painful memories from our consciousness. It is God's spirit taking away their sting and healing the resultant emotional damage. This was Carol's assurance that we would never that he would never leave her alone. She was instantly freed from the grip of painful memories, though she can certainly still recall the experiences, end of quote. Next, Wimber goes on into detail on how to deal with specific cases. He makes a clear distinction between surface and root memories. This is significant for Wimber as healing practitioner must know how to diagnose correctly. He wants practitioners to realize that subconsciousness of a person needs to be dealt with, that is, root memories needed to be healed. The other issue is that it needs to be tackled for Wimber in demon possession. This he notes is what Jesus dealt with in Luke 4, 31-37. Luke 8, cha chapter 8, verse 2, and Luke chapter 9, verse 37 to 43. The demon possessed can be diagnosed as follows. Number one, the sufferer has some control over his or her life. Number two, demons exercise power through convulsions. Three, demons can reside in a person. Four, they have unusual strength. Five, they project new personality. Six, they oppose Jesus. Seven, they give knowledge that people do not know. 8. They use different voices. 9. Sufferers are marked by moral depravity. 10. Sufferers can be delivered. 11. When the demons leave one body, they seek a new victim. 
Wimber elaborates more on demon possession by giving a story of a personal encounter with a demon possessed man. This example is used to deduce certain principles that is, Satan cannot enter believers, Luke 22 3, that demons can be passed on from one generation to another. Dealing with demon possession, Wimber gives a number of principles. Number one, practitioners must put on the whole armor of God, Ephesians 6 10 18. Two, practitioners must have faith and trust the Lordship of Christ. Three, the practitioner must confess sin. Four, practitioners must take on the authority that is theirs as believers. This means the spirit of fear or temptation can be rebuked to leave. Five, destroy all occult objects if demonic activity is strong, then bring a pastoral ministry team. Wimber next moves on to the body and its need to be healed. He deals with the question, why is it that the Apostle Paul hardly at all mentions healing? Wimber replies that the Gospels and Acts, the and Acts, the doctrine had been covered so that the Apostle did not want to go over the old ground. He reinforces this by an example from his own ministry. He himself only taught healing three times in his church, as the church already had the grounding in his teaching. Wimber deals with the issue of those who were not healed. He accepts this if one keeps a clear distinction in the atonement. This helps us to accept that some will not be healed. He uses Sid Lord Baxter to explain what he means here. Quote, the conclusion is supported at once by the fact that forgiveness of sins and cleansing from guilt all offer through the cross freely and certainly and at the present moment to all who sincerely believe, whereas healing for all our infirmities and sickness is not offered freely and certainly at present to all who believe. Not one of those who have believed for forgiveness and cleansing has ever been denied. The thousands and thousands who have believed for physical healing have been denied. Wimber then gives some guidelines for those practitioners in healing. Number one, God wants us to be healed. Number two, then we should realize ministry is a team venture from here. If we trust God, then we show it by action. Three, next, the Holy Spirit is needed to help in healing. And four, there must also be a loving among, love among fellow practitioners as this creates the right atmosphere for healing to take place. How is healing to be practiced? Wimber makes ten recommendations. Number one, the healing environment must be spirit-filled. Number two, there must be a clinic. Here, practitioners worship and receive instruction on how to be healers. The clinic also gives a sense of teamwork. Three, healing is lifestyle ministry. This means we should always be open to people's needs. Four, healing is not formula. It's rooted in God. Five, practitioners must learn discernment. Six, practitioners must learn to speak words of encouragement. Seven, touching a, is a powerful tool to help the sufferer. Mark 5.30. 8. Those who wish to practice healing must have faith in the gift to do the work. 9. Some healers are better at healing some parts of the body than others. 10. Practitioners must use general procedure, which is, which is interview, diagnosis, prayer, selection, prayer, encouragement, and most prayer directions. Second part, comparing Wimber's model with other models of healing. The Copelands, Gloria Copeland believes that evangelism is to be accompanied with signs. The signs prove Jesus is alive. She strongly urges that healing can easily be received by getting into the Word and having faith. She teaches that whatever you need, including health, you can claim from God. In Psalm 139, verse 17, 18, in fact, even if you had a leg missing, God can, can and will give you a new one. She has no time with those who do not agree with this teaching. If you hear that someone trusted God and it didn't do them do them any good, don't believe it. If you or I or anyone else have trouble re receiving healing, we're the ones who are making the mistake. It may be an innocent mistake that comes from being in the dark about some truth in God's word, but it's our mistake just the same. On tap, Gloria Copeland is a powerful speaker. On tape, Gloria Copeland is a powerful speaker. The teaching is that God has brought healing to the whole person, the body is saved as well as the soul. This means the devil has no power over us, and Kenneth, her husband, believes the same. He teaches that it's God's desire that we have what we want. This means healing God well. He relates how God told him he wanted him to have a new plane because God's tired of him having the old plane. In comparing this teaching with Wimber's one is struck how Wimber makes a distinction in the atonement and makes the point that not all are healed but all are saved. This means the atonement can bring healing, but not to all. The Copelands rightly point out the body is saved and the soul, but they push the body's metaphor to the point 
that all healing is received now and not in eternity. This is a mistake, as experience tells us that not all are healed, but all will only happen in eternity. But the comment about the play and the Copeland's teaching seems trivial and silly compared to Wimber's well thought out teaching but not as well thought out as what I would say conservative evangelical teaching. Colin Urquhart. Urquhart believes strongly that the reason the church does not see healing is because people are in unbelief. The church should return to preach the gospel and healing. In his book, When the Spirit Comes, he reports how he first started out as a healer. One of the mentally ill came to him and he prayed for the man to be healed but found the man needed practical help also. Quote, it seemed that nine months of progress has been wiped out. I have related this incident because it highlights a problem. We offered Tony a tremendous amount of love, but it wasn't enough to cope with the situation. He needed to be living in a Christian home. End of quote. Urquhart contradicts himself more than Wimber. Urquhart says we all can be healed, but then he admits natural means are needed. Uh, Wimber's model seems more clinical than Urquhart, and Wimber's teaching is more professional and controlled. Urquhart is the practitioner in the field of everyday life. Critical Reflections One of the things that of Wimber's model is he's thought, the, thought it through. One sees even more in his seminar notes to students, which I was able to look at for a day. Wimber has a tremendous passion for God's love and he longs for others to experience he is a bo sorry Wimber has a tremendous passion for God's love and he longs for others to experience God's love he's a bold thinker and takes seriously New Testament data data which some writers may not like to examine he makes one remark that sticks in my mind and that is there is nothing good about sickness. My heart rejects this comment but that is my prejudice because I don't wish to follow his teaching. Reformed theology, my theology, would wish to hold on to the idea that good can come out of pain which I agree with. This is a, an act that uh, uh, brings a barrier against healing theology which, which, which wishes the masses to experience healing. But it is true to say that sickness is not good. But it is also said that God can take this and use it for his good. Negative remarks. Number one. Wimber criticized Christians as being rationalists who do not agree with his healing model. I think this is an overgeneralization. Billy Graham, J.I. Packer, John Stott, Dr. Martin Lord Jones were all evangelicals who could not be classed as rationalists and who did not believe in Wimber's healing theology. Number two, his subjective arguments are, arguments are a major weakness at times. Often to prove a point, he will tell stories about himself and his wife. These stories are a major building block to his theology, but they are questionable as there are no available witnesses to verify what happened. Three, it is not clear where methodology blends in with mythology. At times, Wimber's ideas seem very much like anthropological research. His idea of touching is well known to be characteristic of primitive man's urges. Four, his ideally ideas, idea that healings are for today could be questioned on the ground of hermeneutics. The healings of the New Testament are often associated with creation of a new time or period in God's plan. This means they are not for today. Five, the issue of emotional healing seems crude in its method. I think it virtually impossible to diagnose what is going on in the subconscious of a person. Wimber failed to give a credible tool to unlock the mind of his sufferers. Seven, Wimber crosses demon possession with illness. That means if you have a spirit of fear, then you cast the demon out. I cannot see this as a practice in the Bible. It also positively dangerous. Let's say I'm dying of cancer. Wimber's theology would say, I need a demon cast out of me. This would not help me in my illness, but only cause emotional and spiritual harm. 7. Wimber fails to even grapple with the theology of suffering. Suffering can bring us closer to God and shape our character. 2 Corinthians 12.9, Romans 8.28. 
C.S. Lewis writes, I have seen great beauty of spirit in some who were great sufferers, and I have seen men from the most part grow better, not worse, with advancing years. And I have seen the last illness produce treasure of fortitude and meekness from most unpromising subjects. End of quote. C.S. Lewis. But, uh, Wimber pays so much attention next to signs and wonders, for example, miraculous healing, that science can easily be made more important than God, the God of the science. Though to be fair, Wimber makes it clear that it is God who is the source of healing, not the practitioner. In Wimber's model, he fails to take seriously free will for the sufferer. What if the sufferer does not agree with Wimber's theology and practice it, but come and practice, but comes to meeting? To, to a meeting seeking help. Failure to recognize the free will of a sufferer makes Wimber's practice open to serious abuse. This procedure could be a web that traps people rather than frees them. The way Wimber thinks is not the way everyone thinks. People should be free to have their own frame of reference in the process of meeting Wimber's practitioners. One young man relates the story of how he was prayed for and was not healed. The Wimber style practitioners accused the young man of being in sin. The young man was emotionally traumatized and went on to die of cancer. Some positive remarks of John Wimber. Wimber believed that the church need experience mass healings today. I think the church does need to be reminded that God can heal and there is no limit to his resources. Number two. Wimber makes me realize that God's ways are not our ways. God can use healings to accomplish many things in people's lives, such as repentance. Three, healings can bring maturity in Christians, something I never thought about before, because the prayer of a sufferer has to exercise faith and patience. Four, Wimber's model allows some people may not be healed. Five, Wimber's exposition of the Bible is often fair. He takes seriously the healing passages of the Bible. If Jesus is seen doing healings, then it must have significance for today. Six, Wimber makes it clear that healing is in the atonement, but is not fully accomplished until eternity. Seven, Wimber takes seriously the emotional hurts people have. He recognize how the Holy Spirit can help here. Wimber... 8. Wimber takes seriously demon possession. The devil is someone to fear and fight. In an age where evil is seen to be a force, this is a helpful corrective as it shows evil is a person. 9. Wimber gives helpful tips to practitioners on how to conduct such a ministry. The recommendations to engage in team ministry is wise and should help to preserve the ministry from abuse. Conclusion I found Wimber's model challenging unbiblical at times but at the same time I have been enriched in studying him he has challenged and disturbed some of my preconceptions he offers a model that honestly tries to grapple with spiritual issues of the Bible and spiritual needs of the times I have tried to be honest and fair in my assessment in my view his model needs to be refined in the area of demon possession and sickness by making a clear distinction between the two. The psychology of emotional healing needs greater thought and is too much influenced by Freudian ideas. The role of practitioners and clients need to allow the client more freedom to appreciate the client's own individuality. The church needs to take seriously the call to pray for the sick is to think about the role of the devil and how Christian theology defeats him, uh, Ephesians 6, and that we need to work as a team. As I said, I don't agree myself with Wimber's theology. I'm a conservative evangelical. I believe that God heals, but that sometimes God doesn't, and he allows us to suffer for various reasons, and I think this is a balanced view of the Bible. But I think that John Wimber's theology is a bit unbalanced. It uses a lot of anthropology and psychology rather than the actual Bible. But all in all I found it an interesting study 
and I hope the information that I've given you will help you to be more discerning when faith healers come uh, to think it through in a more deeper way. Uh, references to this lecture. G. Copeland, God's Will is the Holy Spirit, Harrison House, Tulsa 2000. G. Copeland, Article, Believer's Voice of Victory, July 2001. G. Copeland, Teaching Tape, God's Protection, Kenneth Copeland Ministries. K. Copeland, Love Never Fails, Kenneth Copeland Publications, Fort Knox, Texas, 1994. C.S. Lewis, The Problem of Pain, Fountain Paperbacks, Glasgow, 1982. That's the book that I would recommend. The other stuff is just to see what faith healers are saying. I don't agree with them. But the books that I would actually read and, and recommend are The Problem of Pain by C.S. Lewis and Francis Schaeffer's The New Spirituality, Hodder and Storton, London, 1993. Also, uh, The Charismatic Chaos by Victor Budgin. You can get it uh, second hand and have a look around for that. A Short, The Bible and Modern Medicine, uh, The Pattern of Suppressed, Devon, 1964. C. Urquhart, Receive Your Healing, Hodder and Swarton. C. Urquhart, When the Spirit Comes, Hodder and Swarton. G. Wimber, Power and Healing, Hodder and Swarton. V. Wood, Tony, Mayflower, Christian Books, Southampton, 1988. And also look at the Strange Fire Conference by John MacArthur and his friends and he goes into it. That is where I stand theologically. Uh, but uh, have a look at John MacArthur's Strange Fire. That will give you some resources too. That will be on YouTube. It's a conference of people critiquing the charismatic movement. Anyhow, this is a lecture, so it's designed to get you thinking. Um, like I said, my I I'm in the stream of conservative evangelicalism. Uh, by Francis Schaeffer and Lloyd Jones, but uh, this lecture is to get you thinking, it, it's to get you reflecting, it's to get you studying, it's to get you praying and studying and to look at things in a deeper way. Um, I'm not endorsing John Wimber's theology, like I said, I don't agree with it, but as a theologian, it's important to look at other people's theology and critique it, and uh, I'm, I'm, this is a, a theological lecture and uh, it's designed to get you thinking. Okay, thank you for listening. I'm going to close in prayer. Father God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your love and your grace, and I give you the praise and the glory today. And I thank you for your love and for your goodness. And Father, I commit this video to you. I pray that you bless it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.